Is it a good value there? Brian, do you know what the final is for this So there's two options for the time for the final. Zero and never. Yeah, no. <laughs> What's zero? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the year zero, sorry. Um, um, so I thought Ben would talk to you about it. No? Um, we, can talk about, we can talk about it right now. There's two different days it could be, given the schedule. Um. Right, and so. Well, because you can't give a final in the last ten days of class, and so they're trying to break the rules by. We get around the rules by giving like 11 days for the end of the class or something. <laughs> yeah. So let's do the 17. What? Alright, so classmates. 2.30, yeah, so. Yeah. It's fall time. Yeah. So. I guess you either have 2.45 on the 8th or the 9th. And maybe it wasn't updated. And the final is non-trivial. You have to work at it. No, but... It's, it's good to have a realism expectation. Because I don't know if you may have like another one on the on the eighth or something, but so what do you folks think? Uh, All in favor of eighth? <laughs> yeah. So So December 2nd is the last day of classes. So there's to be no classes, no TA. It might be a review session, and might, you might have a proctor an exam. But if you have a class at this time, then you shouldn't overlap. Should overlap. That's why I have the schedule. Yeah. Yeah. But the final times are scheduled, right? <coughs> they don't overlap. Unless you, have a, you teach at the same time as the class. Right. The finals will be the same time. No, mm -hmm. because you have your proctor lecture, which the lecture could be oh. early, right? So the lecture could be, they could be a lecture right now. I yeah. Why don't you all check and let me know on Wednesday, maybe which time works. All right. Other questions about class stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so the project that's due in here, uh -huh. um, you said it's due Friday. Yep. I kind of had the idea that it's something we're going to be presenting about, but I guess not, I guess we just can send it to you. Right. I mean, we'll talk about it in class a little bit, but yeah, you want to do a slide deck. Um, what you want to have is like your script of what you've been doing. Um, you know, it's like, okay, I did this in R and what the commands were. Okay, if it's, you just in part with in the skeet, you know, what you did there, you know, I pulled this menu down. And, and just know what you're doing. Okay. All right. Um, and we'll talk about that later today, too. Other questions? Okay. So, <coughs> new for the class this, this semester, we're having a little section about species, speciation, taxonomy. Okay, because a lot of you you have to deal with this, or a lot of you have to deal with um, naming species or you're using species in your research, right? Um, and for that, you need to know what species are, problems there are with, with them, and that sort of thing. Okay, so those of you who have the privilege of being in the macroevolution class will have seen some of these slides before, but we're doing them a different way and you know, different level, so. But feel free to comment in and go with that. All right. So new species is covered all the time, right? So there's someone who was in this class a year or two ago, Aaron Floden, discovered new species, right? So what's a species? Um, well, I've been in a speciation seminar now for a yes. semester, and I still don't know the answer. Because <laughs> we missed the first day. Yeah. That's yeah, good. 
Exactly. A unit. A unit. <laughs> so this is a species. Evolving. Independently evolving. That's one sort of thing people. What's the difference on independent evolutionary trajectory? Right. Completely isolated. Okay, so you know various oak trees in North America all you know have fertile hybrids. So they all one species. I think plant taxonomy a lot easier. Oak. <laughs> More or less independent evolving. Ah, this is a fuzzy area. Yeah. So, <coughs> right. So biologists love making up species definitions. Right. Like, this will this will finally fix the problem. Right. If I just have like. So, okay. So you know Ernst Meyer, biological species concept, uh, interbreeding um, natural populations that are recorded by isolated. Right. Or as ways of clustering, recognition, cohesion, ecological species, evolutionary species. Okay, most of these involve some sort of you know reproduction. There's some theory that these work for asexual things, right? Um, those are often a problem. Okay. <coughs> and so one sort of useful framework we've come up with is by Epicurus, um, who thought about okay, so when you go and we're at this point here, right? There's one species. Then up here and here, there's two different species. They don't interbreed anymore. Very different trajectories. Very clear. Right? There's a whole gray area in between here. Right? So here we might have diagnosable differences, right? These live on this side of the river, that lives on that side of the river. Right? Maybe those are a little bigger or smaller. At this point, we might have complete sensation of interbreeding. Right? They don't interbreed anymore. Um, here, one might become monophyletic for all its genes. Right? So every individual here, one could relate to some other individual here, and this is another. There's this back where our discussion about coalescence the other day. Okay, and here we get reproductive incompatibility. Okay, and so depending on what your species species criterion is, you might call it different points, right? So you know, maybe you can fight to the death about you know where are we here, but there are still oftentimes you know clear points here, here, here. Okay, um, it's the only thing we shouldn't be talking about species at all, right? This sort of some arbitrary human human construct, same way like genus or family is, right? And life is always a smear, and so we have to you know just deal with the smear and don't bother naming things. Right? That's a minority view. Um, thoughts on this? Okay. So we have a bunch of populations. We want to lump them into species. And this is a hard problem to solve. Right, so we have, okay, let's put them up this way, let's put them up this way, let's put them up this way. Right, next number of ways of splitting them up is a showing number of the second kind. Right, um, which those of you who are in the species class will learn, this about, learn about this on Friday. Right, so basically, you know, there's Avogadro's number of ways of dividing these into species. Just this set. Right, so there's a lot of ways to do this lumping. Okay, um, the most which, which is the most commonly advocated Species definition. The first one, yeah, biological species concept, right? Well, swell. So how do we how can we test that? Trying to make things breed. Yep. So we have a bunch of cats. Yeah, they're all sort of brownish, orangish cats. Let's try mating them all, right? And I find I get you know these to mate. All works fine. Good. So maybe, you know, this is a con this species, this is a species, okay, this one with this, oh, that's a species too. Okay. <coughs> but also we also have stuff like this, which, you know, this can make with this to get this. This can make with this to get this. Right? So you have one species, or lines of talk is the same species then? No, so actually the biological species concept is actually or potentially interbreeding. So these, these are potentially interbreeding. Right? Going to a zoo and make them bored, and they'll have offspring. There's, as an offspring referral, I think some of them are. So, I, don't know, I, yeah, I don't know the whole taxonomy of these hybrids.
Cool like that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, can start you. <coughs> right. So this is obviously problematic, right? And we don't do this. In, I mean, we don't. We do this because you know big cats are fun, and if you have like crazy offspring, and there's a whole bunch of you know parent offspring conflicts that we see like huge cats. That's what we learn about later. <coughs> but you know we can do this. You know we could do this for a few things. We can't do this for many things, right? We're not going to do this to whales. It's okay. Our blue whales and fin whales are the same species. Let's bring them back to the aquarium. We're not going to do that. Um, are we going to try you know blue whales with oaks? Probably not. Right? There's a sort of limit to how how far we're going to do this, right? We could try pandas. Pandas don't breed with anything in captivity, even other pandas, right? So you can say, oh, pandas aren't, you know, each one's a separate species because they just don't, don't breed, right? I mean, so there's many ways this could fail. Okay. So a lot of people don't, so a lot of people like, like this definition for what they're trying to find out, right? But that's actually not how they define species, how, how, how they actually deal with them in practice. Okay. So it's a distinction between what you want to find in nature and the technique you used as your threshold. Okay. Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. <coughs> so one approach is the genealogical species concept, where you find these clades. So it's you know, the group that's everything more closely related to other things in that group than to other groups, right? And this is pretty easy to run to run in practice, right? So you get a set of gene trees, right? And then we find <coughs> this, and we find that. F through K form a clade. So F through K are a species. These things are not a clade. Right? So what do you do? Well, you could either make the whole thing a species that was not self direction. The large cells are the meta species, so the parasitic thingy. Which is also sort of problematic. Right? <coughs> Another thing is that time to reciprocal monophyly for all genes. We're just looking for a single mitochondrial gene, it's not going pretty quickly. Right? Single nuclear gene takes longer. Five nuclear genes takes longer. You know, eleven thousand nuclear genes takes a very long time. Okay. So you have to go all the way up to here to have a few different species. Under this, this concept. Right? It's a very, very stringent concept. Okay. Easy to apply in practice, it runs with love many, many things. You know, humans and bonobos would be the same species under this. Humans and gorillas would probably be the same species under this. Okay. Not speaking is that much. I think we'll use DNA barcoding. Go for this. Right? And the idea here is that stuff within species is pretty similar. Stuff between species is you know, within the genus or within the family is pretty is, is rather different. So what you do is you find things that are sort of good known species, and you figure out how different they are. And you look for things that are at least that different and call them different species. Okay? And what you hope for is this so-called barcoding gap, right? Where <coughs> the stuff that's at least different by you know, two nucleotides is within species rather than between genus. Now here there's not actually a, a good gap, right? So we have these are within one species and eight things different. Here there's just all within a genus. So there's not a good gap there. So it has some you know, fuzziness in it. And this has been used, for example, in birds. Um, we've got these sandpipers that are very, very different from each other. Right? More different than yeah, some of some species. That's a common approach. Um, it's still very controversial. Okay. <coughs> this is still probably one of the most common approaches. It is morphological taxonomy. Okay. So you go out. I was actually done by one of my advisors. And you go out and you compare you know, populations, it's okay. This one differs from the sun eye in size, should it be the nodes, should it be the process, velocity, right? A lot of hair. Raised ball hair, raised ball hairs. Okay. And now people will do that. They'll also be informed by genetics. If they find that they have. A big divergence between them, right? Um, and also some characters with morphological differences. You might call it different species. It's not just morphology anymore, usually, right? But a lot of description is based on morphology. You can describe a species based just on the genetics, though. Say so this species is something that 
is within this group, it has differs with these base pairs. As done. Okay. And so what we're going to show you is that there are many ways to delimit species, um, but also to getting at the same idea as these reflexively isolated groups. Okay. Now in asexual things, it's clearly it's uh, very different. So like with, with bacteria, you can use something sort of like barcoding, which is like if you're thinking five percent difference at a certain gene, you're a different species. Okay, but it's hard with asexual ones because you know once you you and your siblings split, and no more shall you reproduce with each other, right? So forth. So limiting species and asexual taxa is still a big question. Okay. <coughs> Any questions about that? Okay. Um, when you describe a new species, you need to make a type. What's a type? Right. So you know, we, talk, we talked about how one of Darwin's great ideas was not was to get rid of typological thinking, right? And then it realizes variation. Typological thinking, right here, right? They actually have to call it a type. Okay. Um, why do we have a type? It's a future reference. So if you, if you later decide that this contains five species instead of one, you know what the original specimen is. Right. Yep. Where does the name go? Right. So chimps and bonobos are our are, are closest relatives. They're considered the same species till like 1928. Right? We didn't figure out that they were different species from each other till 1928. And so when we do that, we decide well, which one gets the chimpanzee name, which one gets the new name. Right. And it's which one has a, has the type specimen is one that gets the, the original name. Okay. <coughs> and taxonomy is a series of these sort of moves where we split and merge things. Um, why might this be a problem? Mm -hmm. right, so we often talk about you know, splitters versus lumpers, right? And lumpers have this bias for putting things together into one group, but a bias towards separating them out into separate groups, right? Um, for people who are just, you know, you're doing ecology in the field, you want to see, you know, what species occur in the Smoky Mountains. Why might this be a relevant issue for you? Conservation of what? Of what? Out of species. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, a lot of conservation is built on like a species survival plan and things like that, right? If, we, if I have things that are now two separate species, they're only two different plans. Um, actually, with the Nature Species Act, now we think about evolutionary significant units. So, like, when you have like individual salmon runs, they're different enough that we can. Therapy of each salmon run, even though they're different species, right? But in general, it's easy to have different species rather than a like, different population. Okay, what else? Why is the whole like moving, like splitting and lumping the species, what represents something that could be problematic for you in the field? Let's say you're studying this. Exactly. Right. So someone has observed, you know, this species disperses the seeds of this other plant, of this plant, right? Well, if now that plant is broken into two species, you don't know which, which plant it was moving, right? Um, if if you, it was now lumped, then you don't know which one is which, you know, which one is doing it. This is why for a lot of um, ecological studies now, and evolutionary studies, people actually vouch for their specimens. So if it's split later, you think, okay. We don't know which seed it was. Was it species A or species B? Let's go back and actually look at the seed that they looked at. And so why do people walk in voucher? People know what voucher means? That's okay. All right. And so the number of species we discovering from the time. Over here, we've got five. We'll board. We've got Now, right? <coughs> and this is just showing the splitting, this isn't showing the lumping, right? but taxonomy has lump as well. Okay. So, 
what causes speciation? Here we think of like things that prevent things from interbreeding. Right? We think about species, species as things that don't interbreed much anymore. Here are possible factors that can lead to this. Right? And in my macro class, we spent a whole lecture on this, but here we just want to cover it very briefly. Right? Um, which one's the most confusing? Okay, how so? You can imagine a gene for you know where you're being drawn to, or when you're out. Sure, that's the one that has the capability. Existing knowledge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So we sometimes have things that if a plant's growing on a you know less good habitat, it might flower later. You can get temporary decision that way if no genetic changes. Yeah. One thing you think about is how do you get these, right? So. If everyone's going to the bar to, you know, find mates, and I go to the library, I'm the first one to go to the library, you know, that is going to drop out of the population, right? Because I'm just going to find no mates, right? So how do you evolve, you know, these isolation if, you know, you're going towards this way where you, where you don't have any offspring? It's the mechanisms. Right, but most initial mutations are rare. What if our right? population is growing? Mm -hmm. And then um, one population is growing. Right. So if, you know, we have some sort of initial separation and these graduates start mating earlier and earlier in the day and these later and later in the day, and they come back together, they might have, you know, no, they don't overlap in mating time at all. Good. Okay. Um, and so a lot of these, a lot of these actually work best if you first have some sort of, some sort of isolation of the groups. As we talk about allopatric speciation, a different country, where these are separated by some barrier. Um, initially, you could still interbreed, but then eventually they stop being able to interbreed. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. And there's lots of empirical examples of allopatric speciation. Um, Looking for speciation that occurs in the same area is a big area of interest for lots of people. And people here in this department actually write you know, models to show whether it can happen or not. Um, but in terms of empirically, we actually have very few examples of sympathetic speciation. Species, you know, speciation that occurs in one area. There's like, I think Cocos Island Palm is one. There's um, one that's actually true fruit fly in North America that may be doing it. Um, but there's a lot of examples of it. Uh, like sticklebacks, or mm -hmm. are, they, are these cichlids? I mean, even like, you know, most of those cichlids are occurred in lakes. It's not a lake like Lake Loudoun, you know, it's like, you know, a fat river. These are like big, big lakes, lakes that have you know, lots of subdivision. So even then you can still have an path in the same area. But there might, but there might actually be a case of symmetric speciation. Actually, cichlids are also no cool example because you have these mating cues, right, color and dancing and things like that. But as the water gets more polluted, you get seen as well. It's like, hey, you look good enough, I guess. And so it's actually pieces are going extinct because they're they're hybridizing and merging through hybridization. And all the mating those mating barriers. Okay. Um, hybrid inviability, hybrid hybrid sterility. 
Um, it seems, you know, here we can imagine you know, under selection for reading different times, something like that. You know, how do you be under selection for kind of having viable hybrids? Right, but one of these, but then it's the studio babies, right? So, and you're still in a section for having them be viable. Yes, yeah, so actually, think that these, this, this sort of thing that evolves not due to selection for hybrid viability or hybrid sterility, but due to you know certain other factors that then have a, have the coincidence of leading to hybrid viability, hybrid sterility. Right, so often talk about like WGS molecular compatibilities. We're not going to get into it in this class; it's too deep. But something like that where um, you have these genes that are changing in different populations that have the effect when they come back together of leading to inviability. Okay. <coughs> now, as you have some inviability, you could have selection against interbreeding with other, spe with other species, right? You could have selection for being able to recognize your own your own group better, so that you have you have better offspring on average, right? And so we could have what's called reinforcement. We have you know, whatever the small subdivisions come about, those that can recognize it best do better, and so they you have to reinforce them until we see things like different mating calls and close related species and stuff like that. Okay. Other questions about this? Okay. Now a bit more about taxonomy. So we learned about this. Have you all heard about domains? Yes? Yay. Um, and heard about life a little bit. So we talked about this a little bit. We'll talk about this a little, a little bit more. So these are, so how, how do I define a new phylum or a new family? Or even a new genus? Let's follow the code. Okay, and so there are different codes for different groups of organisms. Okay. And the codes don't talk to each other. Right? So here if I have, you know, this genus has this species. Actually, the flames and congeners. Okay. And so the problem we have these homonyms that same genus but different codes, so the codes that don't talk to interact. And so it can be hard if you're looking up information, you know, on Pyrrhus, you might be getting butterflies or some sort of Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, and so. Yeah, I'm not sure if they do. Yeah. And so, what I want to show here is like different problems with some of the codes you get to watch out for when you're actually doing studies. So, this sort of issue. Um, another issue is you know, the importance of rank, right? So we've all heard, seen, you know, st studies that you know compare number of genera of the Smokies versus number of genera in, you know, Barrow, Colorado Island, and things like that, right? Um, what could be a problem with that? Right, and that's just different in your genus. So it could be the people who are splitting things in Smokies, and they're like splitting things into tiny groups. Whereas in Costa Rica, or P Panama, they like to lump them. Okay, what else? So different amounts of species in genera. What if we were to compare the proportion of genera that are woody in the Smokies versus in Costa Rica? They were to compare the, the, the number, the proportion of genera in the Smokies that are woody versus herbaceous versus those in Costa Rica. What are we wrong with that? Are they IID? 
and then permanent land government is distributed. The same way we were talking about with name for independent contrast, right? Because it's, these are independent, neither are genera. Right? Generally, they're genera. You know, they're not the same, not in, this, in the same. None of the like, one genus is inside the, another genus, right? But it could be that the ones. The Smokies are here, and then Costa Rica is that clade. Right? <coughs> it's not controlled for that either. Okay, and so for a lot of biologists worry about people, you know, thinking that genera are comparable, friends are comparable, even more the trees are thinking about them. Right? Um, and so there was a proposal for a different code called Phyla Code, right, where it gets rid of ranks. So instead of having, you know, rank, you know, what's a, what's the what's the rank for mammalia? You know? you know what mammals are, right? They're furry. They have milk. Are they, so they're a class, right? How about dinosaurs? No. I don't, yeah. And, uh, actually, there's dinosaurs, that, there are two orders within dinosaurs. Yeah. Right? So we, we, we know these clade names, we don't know the rank associated with them. Right? And so, why have people learned both the rank and the name if the rank is meaningless? The rank is based on, you know, someone's, I mean, this is a genus, this is a family. Um, there's no, way to, there's no criterion for that. Right? So how else gets away from that? It just, it just names clades on trees. You can do it by putting blue nose and say, here's a combination of A and B, and all the relatives, all the defendants, is the clade, is the green name, or the red space, right? Or it's right? And the problem with the old code, if you, if you change ranks, names change. Right? So. <coughs> If this becomes a family, if you know, didn't want to change this from sub to family, then this becomes a family name. Right? This name, the ending changes. The ending change. Okay. <coughs> Nothing's changed about the tree at all. And the phylogeny is still the same. The groups are still the same. But they're going to change the names because of this change in rank. All right? And that's what will rankle some people. Right. Yep. Here's file of code. And you know, it doesn't change the names. So you want to call it some order or whatever, you don't care what's in the So it's a that's just giving it to The problem with file of code is people have been working on it for years and it's not really live yet. And so it's, it's an alternate to traditional land, land taxonomy because really these ranks it only names clades, but it's not really used, used in real life much yet. And it might never be. Yeah. Like, True. Right. So that's one advantage of rank that you don't exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So with 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 the rank system, you have, if you know that the end end, you know what the rank is, but you know that they're not within each other. Right. With file code, they could be. Yeah. So you lose, you lose that information. You run people who use that information incorrectly and say, okay, these are equivalent groups, we're both families. That's a trade off. Okay. Another issue with taxonomy is sort of edit wars. You know, here's one on Wikipedia. And this comes from one page. And so here you can see, you know, so every, every, what, is, what is this animal? Fish. All right, yep. <laughs> Sperm whale, right? Um, so I don't know what sperm whale is, cool, but which name is the correct name? And depending on which, which authority you look at, right? So is it mammals of the world, or is it, um, you know, it's mammals, right? Um, <coughs> which group, and you can see people like going back and forth and people are arguing about this, right? Um, and, you know, it gets extreme, right? <laughs> Yeah. And so people argue. So what we should have is with the type, you should be able to say, okay, this is the type, this is where the name goes, right? But if stuff's old enough, it's hard to know which is right. Okay. And for other sort of other sort of fights, there is no way to appeal to authority. Right? So yeah, so we all know know what's right. 
the example of adaptive radiation, like a few species, and you know, some of the habitat, stuff like that. A couple years ago, somebody tried to split them into eight, eight genera rather than one genus. Okay? Um, people went crazy. Right? And, you know, it that. And people we'll said, you know, these are all the main things that require, right? So if we change the nullus to our good names, then we have to change it from Juliana to Uranus, and we go to Mia, make the gender agree. Right? So, so it's now changing. So you can search for Eris, you know, nullus Eris, now it becomes search for Ephiola Mira. Right? Um, So it's not necessarily valid to change or not to change. It just shows the effect of a change. So people who are like using, if you're doing, if you're doing a nullus biogeography, it depends on which authority you use, right? So um, there's no way, there's, there's no way in taxonomy to say that okay, since the Nicholson paper came out later, that's now the official name system. Right? Both name systems are valid. Nullus is one genus or eight genera. Both of those are okay. And depending on who you talk to, they'll use one genus or eight genera. And so it's going to make it very hard to, to deal with this. Right? There's no sort of canonical version um, you can go back to. Okay. <coughs> and this, so this generated a lot of discussion. Okay. Right. And so what do you do in this case? So, you know, most of you here aren't taxonomists, as you are, will enjoy this sort of fight. Right? The rest of us have to deal with it. Okay? I want to figure out for your projects, for example. I want to get information on woodiness of these plants, right? We'll have this study that has, calls them, you know, you know, Rosa rugosa, and this study calls them Rosas oleandus. Um, how do you reconcile that? And so one thing you do is, you know, there's um, name resolution services, right? You can enter in a name and tell you all the synonyms for that name. Okay. So there's one in R called Taxize that connects to various services. A package. And so you can enter in your list of names for all the things you're looking for. I'll tell you all the synonyms that are out there. Yeah, tax size, T A X I Z E. Okay. And of course, everyone wants to have a repository to keep track of what the best names are. Right? And so there's a lot of these. Right? And they don't all agree. Right? So it's. <coughs> you know. I think, you're, I think your set of names is stupid. I'm not my own list. It has everything in it. Well, no, yours is stupid. And so it continues. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So that's another problem with taxonomy, though. With the, like, you know, you're organizing life, but it depends on who's, who's running the card catalog. Okay. And you know, something like this is, you know, for a movement of a species and a splitting of species, there's, you know, you can look at who did the most recent way. But for like general genera changes and things like that, there's no standard. Right. Well, but I mean, what will four North American tropical ghosts don't agree? What do you do? Mostly they do, right? But there's corner cases. What if you're what if you want to look for your plant, you want to look at what the pollen names are doing? Right? So what's the what's the current standard for art for arthropod names? What do you what do you look to for that? You know, you don't know. If they're pollinated by ants, it's different it's a different reference than if they're pollinated by butterflies. Right? And so there's nowhere one place you can go to find out what the canonical name is. So there is no canonical name. You can have you can have multiple pieces in literature. Right? <laughs> it's a failed system. No, but my point is that the fail is a failed system or not. My point is that when you're dealing with real life biological data, like in these projects, you do be able to deal with this, right? So you not only deal with, you know, changes happening in the past, okay, now we figure out there's a two groups that split them up, but also changes in the present day. Different people will, will argue. So if you talk to, to Nicholson, they'll say, oh, there's H and if you talk to Losos, there's one genus. So they're both still publishing. And so they'll each use the, their favorite taxonomy. 
right now. Other than, other than what? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they proposed eight, but I'm not sure if they adopt all of them later. Okay. But everything else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why when the doubts are all in the clay, right? If you want to your clay, you know, rather than you're scared. They can pass like otherwise. You can have no less being, you know, all the stuff except for, you know, cool no ops. You can pass like that's a Right, so. When you're doing your work in general, you should always make sure that your names are being resolved properly. This is also in addition to like all the errors and people like you know, typing in names manually or writing them down in the notebook. There's lots of errors you'll see there too. Okay. So anytime you do a large scale file genetic study, you're bringing in data from multiple sources, you have to really deal with this issue. <coughs> Alright, so names can be hard to do well, lots of conflicts. Right? Why do people bother doing this at all? Why bother doing this meeting? Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, common names that work for like sperm whales, right? If you want to one. But yeah, for like some like moles, it's going to be messy. <coughs> I used to work on ants, and you know, ants have two kinds the red ones and the black ones. <laughs> yeah. Right, so this still serves a purpose, but you have to be careful with it. Okay? Any questions about this? So species, species definitions, taxonomy? Okay, cool.